Pete's work, I, I'm sure, speaks for itself. Uh, he's been practicing over 20-some years. I know he came to the United States, I think, a little over 30 years ago from Latvia. Uh, worked for Sarnan, I think Yamasaki. Uh, but I think uh, among, in fact, I was surprised tonight that really Gunner had not spoken on the West Coast in Los Angeles ever before. And I think we're all remiss in not having him out here. We've had a lot of other people, some of which <laughs> I would just say not have had. But uh, <clears throat> I think tonight we have a serious architect, an architect who doesn't deal, who doesn't deal in, uh, I think, what's new right now. He's, uh, he, I don't think he's a postmodernist yet. I, I, although it's sometimes it's hard to know. We were having discussion tonight. Uh, at dinner just before we came over here, and uh, some of us were, were looking at uh, or discussing what Roche has been doing, and, and, and that was kind of a surprise both to Gunner, and I know it was a surprise to me a couple of years ago when I went back to uh, New Haven and saw what he was doing. So, uh, but I think in what I've known of Gunner's work and what I've seen through the years, uh, I would assume he's carrying through in a uh, very excellent work, uh, very much up front, and uh, he considers himself, I think, uh, an artist architect, which most of the group that we've had over the last year have considered themselves too, but it's just, you know, how do you look at yourself as an artist? So we're very pleased tonight, and I'm just sorry that, our, that we're in mid-semester and not more of our students are here uh, to hear Gunner, but I'm very pleased to have him at SciArc, and uh, I've and with no further ado, I would like to introduce Gunnar to speak to you. Oh, that is in the... Okay, this pocket. I'm supposed to put something in my pocket for good luck. It is true, I have not been here. I have been all around, and I don't know myself why I haven't been here. Maybe I haven't been asked. Uh, and that's, there's something to that, too. They, uh, when I was asked about the title for this presentation, uh, which was several months ago, as a matter of fact, I said, uh, let's call it objective architecture. And I was presumptuously assuming that I would be able to talk about myself, my own work, uh, and uh, actually I'm planning to do that. I, my direction about talking about, in, uh, about my own work was further supported by a recent symposium that uh, was labeled uh, something like architecture in the 80s, trying to cut through and trying to see uh, what the direction of architecture may be in, in the 80s. But as far as I'm concerned, I could only speculate. I couldn't tell what others may be doing. In the 80s, I could only, again, refer to my own work because that is the only thing I know what is happening and the only thing I know uh, what I'm doing. I am going to go into kind of self-analysis with you. I, I intuitively like the group. It is, it is small and it is well, kind of well uh, placed. And uh, I think I can uh, get into this self-analysis and talk about what is in the back of the designs that I'm going to show you, the projects uh, that are going to be here. I'm, um, I have to do it through projection, because I, I, I don't think I can take the, this point in time and, and say this is it. I have to look back in the past, present to the present, and then try to project in, into the future. So I have to start with my own background to some extent and realize that first of all, I was born in Europe. 
and I was born in the 20s, and that was the, the, uh, the beginning of the modern architectural movement. So I have lived and I have also practiced in the richest era when all the masters, the modern masters were alive and they were practicing architecture and none of them were just talking but they were also doing and of course taking their consequences. Um, I myself was surrounded by thousands of years of, of history uh, and then suddenly exposed as a child and I have grown up with the, the modern the development of the of the modern uh, uh, modern architecture, and therefore I consider myself an extension of the history from the past to to reason to reason. I am considering myself, in a way, um, a synthesizer of the teachings, if not the dogmas of the masters of modern architecture. I have not really, I don't have any allegiance to any one of them, but I think I, am, I have tried to synthesize all of them. If there is one that I would without question come close to and, and, and would, would uh, uh, name as one of my mentors is Alvar Aalto, who I have accepted without any, any uh, reservation. I, I consider myself an architect. I am an architect. There's no question about considering. I am an architect. <laughs> and by definition, an architect is one who builds, who designs and builds what he designs. I'm not architectural historian. I'm not architectural journalist or critic or theorist. Architect is one who designs and builds, not one who talks. It is similar, if I make any, any analogy to, to music. Uh, a music uh, critic, music critic does not compose, nor the journalist composes, nor the theorist composes, but it takes a composer, it is the it is Brahms who composes, but Brahms doesn't write criticism, or Brahms doesn't also uh, present theories. He composes. He is the creator. And architecture does start where words leave off. So the architect basically is a doer. Architect also is an artist. He can be an artist. Not all are, but architect basically is an artist. And if, if he is an artist, then he works with the tools of an artist. And architecture, his creation is an art form. So he works with form and texture, uh, color. He wo works in metaphors. He works with symbols. He creates either his, uh, uh, there is symbolism in his creation, in his architecture, or he creates symbols, and he works with vision. Uh, I always like to seek for meaning in architecture and to seek for concepts and then work with the concepts. I also believe, and that is very important, I want to underline that, that it is possible to create objectively. And to create objectively, not by uh, self-denial, but by balancing creativity and practical knowledge. And I will come later on a few other pointers that I think that I'm following that, that, that helps to do that so. The, uh, I'm very aware of the, the, my physical self, or as a matter of fact, I can speak it in, um, and say that architect has to be very aware of his physical self. We are 
when we uh, come in this world, we are eight, pine, eight pounds or nine pounds or whatever pounds, and uh, that is the uh, heritage that we have, and we have to supplement our body ever after. We have to supplement and work with our biochemistry and our well-being, our physical self really is so much determined on what we take in, how we supplement ourselves later on, which gets into basic biochemistry or, or diet. But there is another kind of diet, which maybe is the, the, it is the intellectual self, the brain, the generic heritage, which you also have to supplement ever after, after you have been, after you have come into this world. There's a beautiful realization that came, and that is the power of one's mind. The power which also recognize the uh, the presence of intuition in the creative process or that allows the intuitive process to act in the creative process. I came fairly late to realize that thinking is not a conscious act, that actually your, your thinking is done on an un in an unconscious level. We only call thinking a very small and slow phase in, our, in the working of our brain when we kind of retrieve something or when we tell ourselves, oh, I have to think about something. That is only an effort to retrieve it. Actually, we are creating, uh, we are thinking at tremendous speeds and uh, I'm beginning to enjoy the fact that I don't have to be conscious in the process when the thinking takes place. So I'm, I'm fascinated with the, the design process, which also is basically a subconscious process. After you have done your work, you can rely on, on your um, brain to, to do the job for you. The, 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 uh, the uh, moment, the combustion process between the conscious and the unconscious, which we would call creativity, is really the one, that one moment that we are waiting for, that is the moment when we are uh, being creative and we are, are able to visualize, conceptualize, and then also um, realize. So, the uh, realization that our mind is, is so powerful and that you have to treat it with great care and finesse and you have to feed it and, and all that is, is, a, is a realization that I don't only talk about, but I also teach that in, in my, <clears throat> my classes at school and I try to make my students aware of that. Uh, and uh, the realization of, of how the mind works or how the brain works and how the, the two sides of the brain are interacting and all that. It is, it is a realization that, that uh, to me came quite late and it came to me as a beautiful, uh, beautiful discovery. And uh, uh, when I will talk about the projects that have been done and I will, will um, uh, apply certain self-evaluation or, or, or criticism or, or whatever on those, it is always post-concept. It is, I don't believe in having a theory and then creating with the theory. I create and then I find what is in back of it. So I, I really don't believe in theory. I know you are going to probably remark to me later if, or somewhere in the middle you'll say you are theorizing about your own work. Maybe, maybe you'll be right, but uh, we'll see as, as, as I go on. The, uh, 
the main the main thrust in my interest in or in in design is to to create objectively can we create objectively how is it is it possible to disconnect the artist creator and his mind his storage his heritage experience and education and knowledge from acting impinging on the process uh, uh, in the creative process I think that if the uh, factors that we consider the uh, that we synthesize if they are kept in balance then you are able to create objectively still considering that you are an artist and that you will have certain subjective input in it but you cannot overextend one you cannot uh, you cannot take one facet and overextend like you may become terribly involved in 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 or uh, in the let's say in structures very likely that your solutions will lean towards the structuralism or structural counter if you suddenly uh, pick up a magazine and and uh, the whole issue kind of blows your mind and and if you are not guarded in and and mature enough let's say in in evaluating what you see and what what in in implication or uh, influence it may have you may get overextended if that facet overextends the whole solution goes the wrong way so your heritage and, and um, mind storage and experience and all that is like a keel in the boat that, that, that allows you to take all kinds of storms that may be or wind that may be coming on and you will not tip over. You'll keep your, you'll keep your line and you'll keep going and you will, will sail in, in certain style. The, also, we have to be careful that we do not bend the truth and reality out of proportion. That that goes again with the uh, coming my coming back to the to the facets that 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 are influencing uh, our our decision making. Well, how do you how do you do that? Well, you have to stay yourself. You have to stay self when listening to others' dogmas, theories. Uh, and mannerisms. You have to be strong enough in the previous that I was mentioning uh, that you you are not affected by whimsical things. And <clears throat> I do welcome though the verbalizers and the single facet promoters in architecture, the ones who are not really dedicated to synthesis but are interested in in in. Um, in uh, uh, promoting a certain uh, direction, they are kind of mini dogma, dogma, dogmatists, uh, uh, and and uh, uh, they do give me supplement and impulses and, and all that. But really, the architecture starts where the words leave off. And uh, uh, having said that, I also realize that I have talked quite a bit about. About, about architecture, but since I know that I also have uh, maybe 160 slides coming up, I will hide behind those as, as, we, as we proceed. Maybe I can have the first, first, first slides, and uh, I have to say a preamble, and that goes back to, to my earlier remark that, that uh, part of my my remarks this evening are generated by my previous uh, exposure to that symposium on the architecture in the 80s. I couldn't answer it. I had to go back and again talk about myself and look at my own work, what influenced it and how it has gone through the years and how much of it has survived and how much of it has not. The, uh, as I said, the architect has to be self 
and I, you are going to discover as I talk some uh, some uh, uh, things that will contradict very likely because I'm I'm not very uh, uh, precise sometimes in my expression, but I will talk about myself and some of the external influences that I had, which I have to admit did happen at a given time. Now, I'm showing the first t slide, which is 1960, when I started practicing architecture. I had just gotten out of Yamasaki's office, where I spent three or four years, and um, I was beginning to feel this, this, this freedom to, to, to get away from the, the very intricate surface treatments that Yama was getting into. I did enjoy my years with Yamasaki because that was the time when he was trying to break with Mies and he was seeking his own architecture. The truth was that he found it. And uh, when he found it, then of course, there wasn't that much for some of us others to really look for. And that was the year when I left. As the reaction came, this building, which was quite influenced by Palladio. I also had visited Italy at the time. Also as, an, as a reaction, uh, where I wanted to have a very strong, simple form that, that wouldn't in any way uh, be difficult to, to detail or, 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 or visually uh, uh, very delicate, since I was dealing with a orchard of apple trees with very fine texture and this thing had to, this building had to establish its, its uh, presence there. The, also the first, first uh, interest in the daylight that came through the wide overhangs protected the glass and then through the center the glass, the uh, core was pushed which uh, um, let the light into the center of the room. That's 1960. Yeah, okay. As, as um, the next year comes, there is further inquiry in, in the state of architecture at the time, and that is looking at the um, uh, development of concrete, which is the, this is the first building, the highest building ever built with the ultimate strength method, method in, in calculating the, the structural strength, but the important uh, part here was uh, my kind of disagreement with the, the, the uh, Mission, uh, uh, Mission uh, modular approach to, to structure, where um, whether it was an office building or an apartment building, everything was following the modular basis, which many times brought matters like columns into the wrong, wrong uh, positions and all that. And the building on the left, which is an apart bu apartment building, as you can see, has a kind of a syncopated facade. And the columns are, are located where they belong, as, as you see on the plan to the right. It's breaking. It's beginning to break uh, with the uh, dogma in the, uh, at the time. In 62, uh, a metal building comes along, which, which is placed in a very contam uh, contaminated uh, area, a refinery site for an oil company, and the building begins to assume the, the, the dark color to hide the, 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 the crime coming from the air. Also, the flushness or the uh, vitreous uh, finish of the uh, metal panel uh, is, is uh, the, the skin of the building. I have to say that uh, I had made some pledges. I somehow made pledges whenever I left my previous uh, mentors or, or employee. When I left Arosan and I was kind of trying not to get into uh, architectural technology too much because the tech center experience, uh, which was very heavily technology-oriented, technology was, was uh, a lot to have in, in those years that I was there. And I said, I don't want 
that for a change I'm going to shy away. Now here I am uh, uh, five, six years back working again at the technology, the skin technology. Now the building uh, does something else. Uh, it is in a, in a way formed by, by, uh, by the exterior uh, formation of the south and the uh, facade and the west and the east facades, uh, which are uh, having a heavy projections at the floor line. What, what really is happening is that there are ducts inside. The mechanical system is running on the outside of the building and it's shooting air in from the outside and at the same time acting as sunshade uh, uh, from the south and at the same time allowing the building's skin to be washed down, uh, which had to be done frequently. So the uh, environment here begins to play on the, on, on the architecture. And then you see there's a certain flushness there still maintained uh, between the skin, skin and the building. Now, years go on, and in 1963, I'm, I'm coming to a realization that I always wanted to do was the building done out of one material. That was concrete, where I really said I was sick and tired of details and joints and, and uh, following uh, cracks in the wall around uh, and, and leveling them off for, by, for hundreds of, 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 of feet, on and on and on. I wanted to do something that is very simple. So this concrete building was uh, the next for there was only uh, concrete and glass infill where, where the light was coming in, and wood was the other material used where there was some uh, contact, body contact, with the surfaces like uh, the, the chairs and the rails and the altarpiece. There is, a, it is a basilica, very straight basilica, uh, and uh, very symmetrical except on the outer end, as you can see, there is a symmetry introduced in the development of the cross and the seating. Now, as far as light is concerned, this was the next step towards working with, the, with daylight and the realizing, or at least uh, uh, using the dif reflected, diffused uh, daylight, which is thrown onto a plain wall plane and then diffused back into the space. And uh, as a matter of fact, uh, from the first building on, daylight has been a major consideration in, in the architecture that I, I have done. Nineteen sixty-four. It's only four years after starting the practice, the first collision with the history comes. So pseudo, pseudo Renaissance building is the Detroit Institute of Arts, uh, which needed an addition, and for some reason, uh, I was chosen as the designer for it. And uh, uh, here began the, the exploration or the. Uh, uh, the interest in, in working with a form, with a uh, given uh, historical form, which really was a pseudo form, but forgetting that, still it existed, and reacting to that in a way where it would be uh, sympathetic to, but not mimicking, and uh, the uh, the result here is to recognize the main features of, of the uh, Renaissance. This is a very deceiving building, actually. The, the center windows, there are, there are three stories behind us. It's a super scale, which is very hard to deal with in, a, in contemporary terms. So uh, I try to, again, to work with the scale uh, on the same level. They have worked there before, except without introducing the, any kind of a division, any kind of a fenestration, but running fenestration without recognition of the floor lines, only with slight uh, 
projecting plain indication, uh, almost a secessionist kind of uh, approach to, to that breakup of the wall plane. The strong Renaissance corner is maintained. However, the very, very tip of the corner is violated by breaking it totally and completely open into a glass, glass sliver. As you can see in the behind the bus, it is it is a strong, very strong corner, but then the very tip is 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 is, is uh, violated. The whole building is treated as a container rather than a, uh, a big one single space into which trays are are placed. Uh, and these trays appear on the inside in the form of the balcony. The new Structure never touches the, the existing one. The existing one is sunblasted white and becomes the, the, the background. And so the two are interacting w uh, in one space. The same year, another commission comes, which uh, is, uh, has to do with the existing vernacular, and that is the University of Detroit Administration Building. The University of Detroit is, is, is a mission-style kind of uh, architectural campus, and they wanted a building that would be maybe the highest one on the campus and one that would signify the entrance and also the, the, uh, the uh, 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 seat of the administration. Now here, the existing characteristic of the uh, building is interpreted in contemporary terms. Now, this is a Jesuit school, a conservative one, where the priests still teach in black garbs, you know, and, and uh, uh, but they want it to be, project an image of being progressive, but still on one hand, on the other hand, still being traditional, uh, and so, the building had to express that kind of, call it almost schizophrenic thought, but uh, still maintaining the, uh, the unity with the existing. So the verticality is indicated with the, with the column uh, rhythm here. The color is this black slate is, is uh, picked up from the uh, sooty uh, stone of the limestone. And the roof is, instead of projecting over as the tile roof does here, it is undercut. Uh, and uh, surrounded by a floor of sheer glass, the structure stops at the floor line of the last floor. Then it's interrupted, and the roof goes over like a huge umbrella suspended over it. And this is where they, they uh, Forwardness comes in. This is where the the uh, the uh, the the uh, more um, uh, progressive nature of the school is expressed in in the use of structure. In again, in the open corner, and in the uh, roof vaulting over the space. The roof is uh, lead coated copper and uh, slate and dark glass. Well, come years 1965, which was a nervous year because the world was terribly worried about what will happen if the population will keep exploding. And uh, as you remember, Soleri proposed these huge mushrooms, containers in order to preserve the land uh, put people in large containers and keep the land uh, rolling. Uh, Doc Siaris proposed the one big pancake between uh, New York and, uh, and uh, through Detroit, Minneapolis, Chicago, and so on, uh, of urbanity that, that would uh, be called megalopolis and all that. So we began to go into megastructures. Now there's some, there's some erotic things that were going on at the time, we were worried that by year 2000, we are going to build a city equivalent of Chicago every year also 
we will be crawl humanity will be crawling all over the all over the map and and uh, uh, they were concerns now that was when the time when the megastructure came in it started in England in a way but here you see uh, Kenzo Tanga's proposal for the Tokyo Bay the extension of, of um, Tokyo and uh, that was also the year when Tougaloo College was conceived, the master plan for a uh, system of building a college that could expand as required or endlessly, one that would bring in very close proximity the academic and also the residential uh, uh, living. And uh, in this master plan, which really was cut off at the 500 student uh, range, we see the academic uh, units going uh, east and west and the, the living units going above, north and south. Our charge was to design an environment that would be uh, semi-urban uh, or urban as much as we can to introduce the student. This is the black college in, in Mississippi to introduce the student to uh, uh, urban living, having come from the cotton fields and, and, and little uh, farm uh, buildings and all that. Now, this <clears throat> was a very challenging thing at the time, and we, we devised this system that would allow growth and there's a little beginning of metabolism in here because there's a unit that is the 30 by 30 bay which can grow sideways either way up and down and uh, uh, fill in the uh, space, create the space or after that, after it can be filled in. It is a precast unit for most part uh, which uh, spans, usually the horizontal is precast, the vertical is poured in place uh, around column with a precast capital, a little uh, casting on, on top of that which can receive the beams uh, at will and uh, uh, thus perpetuate, perpetuate the whole system. The long building is the second system that is designed for the residential use and the, the other is with the left, the present library is the academic kind of space. It, the interesting part is that uh, the interior and the exterior has the same uh, qualities in, in terms of, and a certain ability to create space so that Exterior space can be as articulated and as broken down in scale as interior, or vice versa, because of the system. You, can, you are either in the unit or out of the unit, but you basically are working with this 30 by 30 foot unit. The same year again, another commission comes, which happens to, which turned out to be that first energy conserving school building done with, with a, some thought to it. In other words, with, with consciously done as an energy conserving building. This school in Lincoln, uh, Lincoln School in Columbus, Indiana, uh, begins to, to, to broadcast its, its uh, uh, energy conserving qualities first going into, uh, into the most economical kind of plan, which is a square, uh, then being very compact in its plan, and thirdly, also being very frugal in terms of how fenestration is used. The tree ring around it uh, protects it during summer months from the sun rays, protects the walls, and in winter, it lets the sun go through and heat up the walls. But these were all interesting, interesting byproducts of the whole thing. But the real reason why this school went so shy 
uh, and was hiding behind the tree ring and was depressed partially into the ground was the reason was something else. When uh, we received the commission, we began to subscribe to the local press, and we found out that after having all the kind of name architects uh, a building there and, and uh, all that, they, the, the city people wanted a break and uh, wanted to, uh, first of all, wanted no building there at all. They didn't want any school. And there were uh, articles in the newspaper against another one of those, uh, those glorious buildings by the architectural elite. So the building began to react to it, or the architect did, in a way. And the building started to, to go background or, or shrink smaller and windows smaller and put the trees around so nobody can see it and put it halfway uh, below ground so that, you know, so it's low profile and open it all up so that kids can run all over. And, and uh, so that was a reaction to those, artic to those articles. And it was interesting to note that it is, has worked very well uh, and the townspeople have accepted it without even ever knowing that, that the real reason was their angry letters. This detail here shows one of the energy conserving devices that is a single window that gives uh, light and vision to two spaces through one opening. And the, the window is in the best position, in the right position, because it lights the wall, and the wall becomes a reflector. And the reflector gives light to the room. You never get light from the room from looking right at, at the daylight. All you see is glare. It, the light has to hit something to bounce back to be light. So, and uh, this works very nicely. Uh, now the kids have uh, also displays inside there. Uh, <clears throat> I guess it's the same year still. It's a house that uh, uh, a commission that I, I, I took because I was interested to uh, to satisfy the the owner's desire to build a uh, a building that uh, a house that they. The idea they had brought back from the islands, from Greece. And um, they wanted, actually, they wanted a polygonal kind of building which did not have any particular uh, uh, system or uh, in their construction. And I, I knew I was not able to, to do that because I always wanted some rule to what I was going to do, what I can do. And uh, so I had to, in invent a way how to break down the wall, the, straight, the, the common straight wall and all that, and develop a way where I can be, I can justify myself in doing it and also I have a way to do it. So this is a one-shot field theory that you do it for a particular project and then you burn it. You don't repeat 100 times over and over again and put people in misery. But you, <laughs> so this was an orthogonal uh, system and a uh, kind of radiating grid overlapping and, and it gave me enough opportunity to work and vary with the wall to, uh, to, to achieve that. Actually, it's a very small building in the center, there's an atrium that has that big uh, uh, hat over it with an eccentric center. But then, you, if you follow these lines, you see that from that point, there are openings into every room in the house. So basically, the house opens up. The whole house opens up to the atrium. And, and you can see end to end through the, through the house. You can experience, you have a special experience seeing through the house. But then if you want to, you can, close, you can close that little flap here and you can see in or out. And uh, 
Anyway, so uh, this is how it uh, broke down. And um, that's the way it looks. The, 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 uh, the interesting part here, again, is the, the way the light is dealt with. Uh, like here, for instance, these four fins are not just just uh, frivolous, frivolous uh, uh, fins there. They really are uh, facing a neighboring property. And in order to uh, still get the whole full uh, view out of the room, but to not to allow the neighbor to, to look in, the wall is 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 divided up uh, and, uh, and creating maybe four windows shielding, uh, shielding the view. The, um, the atrium is, is crowned by this, this uh, uh, in the pyramid at the top, the cone at the top, uh, which uh, acts as a reflector to reflect light back onto the side walls. There's also uh, light coming in between the two, the two roofs, so to say, uh, giving a continuous light or, or very uh, rich kind of gradation of light from gray to, to white or to white to black almost uh, in this in-between space. At night, that uh, it can be lit by the uh, uh, artificial lamp at the top. 1968 came the year when uh, one of the major commissions came, which was uh, the most delightful, the most complete, the most everything kind of commission I have ever done. Co complete empathy with the client and and complete understanding from the client side how an architect works, and uh, uh, still control over the architect, and still uh, uh, certain restraint that we had to uh, exercise. But it, it is a monument, a monument in a way, to the capitalistic society. It's a um, it's a bank building, a Federal Reserve Bank, which. Uh, became or is an almost an icon uh, of, for our uh, capitalistic society. We don't always recognize the fact that, that banks are our expressions, really, of our society. They are the monuments of, of, our, of, our, um, of our society. We many times don't want to, to recognize, but if you drive in any town, and I was driving to Tulsa just a few weeks ago to that symposium, and the student driving me said, look at those buildings. You know, the high, all the high buildings are banks. You know? And it looks like whenever we have, uh, we have to admit that we do have bank buildings representing our, our kind of aspirations, unfortunately. Um, it is a catenary building that, that spans over a uh, major space, four floors high actually, below ground, and there are 11 floors above. I'm not going to get deeper into the um, explanation, but in the, in the sequence, it was an important, important happening, uh, and I go back. And as I, as I go back through my slides, I find that somewhere there's a slide like this. And I began to wonder how that got into the other one. And that's the interesting, the, that's the interesting, that beautiful phenomenon of your mind and your memory, your storage, your uh, synthesis uh, that you do, the subconscious one. And I found this. And I was so happy. I was so, so proud. That I was so happy that I found it. And I had seen this five years or, or more before that, that, that was conceived. Not consciously, but subconsciously uh, uh, integrated and, and uh, uh, synthesized into the solution of them. There are others that I'll show you later.
Now this is, um, after all that, I become involved in another project. This is restoring a house in Italy with a friend, architect, Latvian architect, Astrid Zarina. Uh, and and as, a, as a retreat to uh, get away from all of that. Uh, it's a hill town in the middle of Italy. And uh, after the bank, which was so technological and so full of, of, of detail and structure and all that, it was very, very nice to get, go in and do this, this vernacular kind of uh, architecture. Simple. Now, all right, that's that much for romantic notions. Now this one here is 69 and back to, back to reality and here I am in Duluth, Minnesota on the edge of Lake Superior to design a library. Duluth is a city 15 miles long maybe and very narrow and a linear city along the, uh, along the lake. On the, on the west end it ends here on the west side and then it goes way up into the east. So the city ends here. The library site was at the west end of the west end of the town. <sighs> oh, um, next to the site, and the site is very long and narrow, next to it was a railroad yard which they thought they would abandon at the time. And uh, so the first thought came in mind was that maybe the building should be put on the railroad tracks uh, so it could go up and down um, on, you know, according to the calendar or, or whatever, and serve the whole city instead of the city driving to the west end and having all the problem, we could go up and down. Now, that didn't go over. Uh, and um, I didn't expect that it would, but it had its, 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 its byproduct. It still, it still remained a um, dynamic kind of building. It, it, it still was one that was directional building, one that said, I am going that way. It said that with, its, with having a prow, with having a, a back and a front. Also, it had assumed quite a bit of the nautical uh, architecture and of the ships and all that next in the, in the harbor. It was done in 62 or, or, or whenever it was, but still, we are still completing it because it had gone over several metamorphoses and the latest was that we had to adapt it to the energy conserving um, uh, uh, attitudes and you can see that, that, uh, that it is already uh, saying something about the, the energy and the, the fact that this, the windows are very small, the uh, incoming, uh, incoming uh, heat gain or heat and the heat loss is, is kind of to a minimum that the, the, the upper part of the space is projecting over the lower part and there's light reflected in and you will see later on the slides how it, how it reacts. But um, it is placed next to a very lovely old, old building which is actually the railroad station and now the the uh, historical museum for city of Duluth and these two uh, are trying to find a dialogue in, in its, uh, uh, but there are a great deal of similarity on it. For instance, the, the skin of the metal building is, is, has the feel of the slate on the, on the roof and, and the, the, the round shapes, the turrets and all that uh, interact with the, um, uh, with the uh, metal, metal building. It has, it certainly is going to take off, or it can take off. It has a direction, it's a dynamic kind of thing. So it retained some of the original thought because it would have been on the other side of the, of, 
of the railroad station on the tracks going up and down, but now it's anchored here and it stayed here. Uh, inside is, is uh, this is one of the construction sheds that it's a uh, kind of a classic bibliotheque type of space with a uh, lantern on top with the light coming in over the reading area and the stacks uh, are yeah, on, on the low side. That's also a year where certain setbacks came. Uh, city of Corning is split by the river and they desire to build a library. Uh, the city is also almost equally divided in population. So the logic is, if you are asked to do a library to serve the city, where do you put it? You put it in the river, right? Because it's the center point and both sides of the, of the city uh, would be using it. At the same time, if you do that, it becomes the way the two sides communicate or the pedestrians use that uh, going over. The uh, high school is there, the junior high is here, the grade school is here, and the, and the fire department is there. So there's continuous, continuous back and forth. So uh, without being too pompous about it, uh, this building connects the two sides of the river, extending the, the faceted architecture of the levee and taking it into the bridge. And, uh, but it didn't go over because, again, it didn't go over because the city thought that it should be built on taxpaying land and not on, on public. So the second, a second uh, proposal was made which was not built, but now looking at, at it after many years, uh, someone realized, my son, as a matter of fact, who was writing about it, realized that there is a great deal of metaphor in, in this, with a circle being the uh, present extent of knowledge, that, as, as we know, and they uh, thrust through this round circle, which are glass prisms, are uh, penetrating. And that's the quest of knowledge that, that uh, we want to uh, achieve. Uh, and uh, there is a great deal of symbolism or a metaphor in, in that. 1970, and I'm giving you these years because I want you to remember what happened at the time, uh, because they were influences. They were influences, and some were coincidental with other things that happened in the in the world. And I I want to mention that because it is so that at given time in different parts of the world architects do similar things because they, they react, they synthesize the events that, that take place in the world. And, and like this 1970 was the year of the Osaka uh, World's uh, Exposition in Japan. And uh, that was also the years or the time when we were so aware of the um, space exploration, space travel, and so on and so on. So there were, there were influences, very strong influences at that time. Plus, it was a time when the minimal, minimal art, minimal sculpture was very much uh, uh, in the forefront of, uh, in our art world. So here you see a small parallelogram building in the city of Houston at the point where the city grid shifts. Houston is uh, uh, on two grids, and this is the pivoting point. And it is there to kind of be sentry between the residential area, which is at one scale, and the, the uh, commercial uh, and cultural area, which is at another scale. 
It doesn't know really how to best do it, but you'll see it will do it by not assuming any, any scale for itself. This is the Mies van der Rohe Museum uh, across the street, a rather formidable uh, shape or, or size vis-a-vis uh, -vis that smaller building. Now, that's, that uh, if you remember how it was placed, you'll see that this parallelogram does certain things. It becomes kind of a funnel uh, that, that funnels you into the residential area if you come from the east side. If you come from the west side, it opens up it to the, to the larger scale spaces. Uh, in its inner working, that parallelogram shape allows the artist to work with a longer dimension uh, that is, you know, goes 50 feet more if you take a square and you rack it in the parallelogram, uh, which being an experimental museum, in a sense, it means an awful lot. You still have the same number of square feet, but you have more uh, wall space. You have the same wall space, uh, but longer dimensions to work with. It is really a sculpture, in a sense, a scaleless one. And what makes a uh, building scaleless? It is the absence of known elements like columns, doors, windows, or anything that, that we can relate to. Now, once you, once you take them away, you begin to uh, be scaleless. Here, the entrance is through the crack uh, uh, there, which is 24 feet high and 3 feet wide. And then on the inside, it is converted into a horizontal dimension by the use of the uh, triangular space. Another building that year, that is the 70, is uh, this one that, that really is very undecided in a way in its, in its, uh, uh, in its personality. It was difficult for me to work with this very uh, kind of uh, problem so uh, paradoxical in a way. I had to work with a site which has never been touched by human hand on one hand. On the other hand, it had to house the most sophisticated hardware there was in the world at the time, which was computer. And there were acres of computers that had to be placed there. And so how do you, what is the architecture? What is the enclosure that you work with to, to uh, satisfy both? The sylvan kind of uh, landscape and then the, uh, the uh, hardware, the technology that is so foreign to the site. And uh, um, I decided to meet the uh, technology or the content, meet also with the same kind of approach to the, to the envelope, to go to the high tech and uh, provide polished surfaces, either in metal or glass, which would reflect the environment around and at the same time be a commentary on, on the, the state of art and state of architecture and technology uh, at, at the time. The problem was that, that uh, there were also people, though, in, in this. And there are people behind here, and there are machinery behind the metal part. That zone is the dividing line between the two, uh, even in, in the uh, this wide, for instance, this wide band is a corridor. Uh, and uh, since treated as a, as a, sculpt as a sculptural form uh, and as a scaleless form again, there's no room for, for architectural elements. So those perforations are not uh, in the vernacular or the vocabulary of, of the architectural known element. On the inside, the same way, there is the red zone, which um, uh, connotes the, uh, the, the boundary between the 
to. The high technology is carried over in other, the choice of other materials, like plastics, glass, extrusions, and all that. But there are contacts made with the nature uh, at certain levels for, you know, uh, on the site. This is the same, the same town where the, the river bridge was uh, uh, going to be proposed. Another structure takes place, which is a civic one, and that's it. it's a, uh, a fire station. It is placed now, instead of being placed in the middle of the river like the ri library would have been, it is placed on one side. It is next to a bridge so that the fire department can get over that in a hurry. It was so efficiently uh, engineered as far as the communications was concerned that, that other fire stations could be eliminated and only one uh, would serve the whole uh, city. The building itself seeks a form, since there is no vernacular really to relate, it begins to relate by giving broadside to different uh, to different directions in the city, uh, and the triangle turned out to be a very uh, effective, uh, also functional form for the for the um, building uh, arrangement. And after one uh, after one lecture, someone got up and said, uh, "Do you know that uh, the?" Uh, Triangle is an ancient symbol of fire, and I said, no, I didn't, but that's good to know. And then I, and that there are some <coughs> really, some symbolic meanings to that. Now, here, there is an analogy there. Actually, this thing here, the fire station, is a three-part uh, structure. There's a static part and a kinetic part, and there is one that you'll see that is. Uh, the similar similarity here is with the 2001. To, in a way, there's a spaceship and mothership and a baby ship, and the same here. Now, this is static. The uh, there are two parts. The static part is the. Um, firehouse itself, which begins to assume certain kinship with the, uh, the kinetic unit, the fire truck, and then there's the R2-D2 type that is the connecting one that connects the two, or that's where the coal emits from into it. So it's a three-part three unit. Without any reservation, the building begins to assume the, the, the uh, virtues and the assets of, of the kinetic unit, which is the protective uh, treatment to the metal wall, which is no different than, than the, the car uh, or truck wall. Uh, this is the checkered plate, which becomes a base and a threshold and all that for, for, for the building. Of course, the color is already agreed upon that it's going to be, they are going to be kins being inside. Further on, the technology carries on into the, into the use of gasketed windows. Uh, 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 and, and so on. They are not windows. I misspoke again. They are perforations because window is, again, one. Uh, uh, see, where we have a recognizable element here, it is pushed back, and that's the door. But these are really perforations that, that um, um, exist. And the, um, <laughs> the, uh, the signal for the building is on all three corners, we have the strobe lights as the silent alarm. Uh, and uh, again, that is kin. And when these things go up in the Shemang Valley, which is uh, always foggy and all that, it's fantastic at night. You know, this, it, the whole valley goes red. It's, uh, <laughs> it's uh, but uh, they didn't want sirens and so uh, Well, we are coming near to the end. 1974, this is part of Italian landscape. I was very interested to see how the Italian peasant uh, deals with the straw. 
Uh, and they make those fantastic uh, buildings, those straw straw buildings, and it just just was an interesting interesting thing to see. Uh, I'm going further now into something that I call sculpture. I try to always not to say building, but it is sculpture. It is a church, a Baptist Southern Baptist Church, that uh, gave me. Uh, a very interesting time in trying to find the expression for for this particular uh, uh, congregation. It's a black church, black Southern Baptist, and it was a fantastic group of people. The uh, I felt that uh, uh, since a group like this has never existed before, they also deserve an enclosure that never existed before, that it shouldn't be one that is a little uh, colonial church or an independence hall replica or, or, or whatever colonial building, but it should be unique to them. So what, uh, as soon as you start putting building elements together, again, you end up with a steeple and a, and a door and the people and, you know, and, and a little church. So uh, it became, a, uh, the approach was to give them a sculpture. And it's a, it's a metal, it's a metal uh, building, a very simple metal skin, as you will see. It is, the color was chosen by fairly lengthy discussions with the owner. And they identified why they liked the yellow because it was warmth and hope, sincerity, prosperity, and all, all good things, basically. And uh, it really is a bright spot in Detroit when you look from the, uh, from the uh, up from the tower. But what's inside that sculpture? Well, we have seats for the congregation. Then we have kind of a canopy that, that, that Powers over, which is this here. And there's a hood over the whole thing. Now, this hood is articulated, as you see, that there's a part that is over the seating area, and then there's part that, that kind of harbors the hood. Uh, better seen here. Uh, that back wall is reflective, it's, it's a mirror. It's a mirror. It does two things. It brings people together by reflection. The congregation sees itself. Instead of looking through the hats, by the ears, and rubbernecking around, you know, you can just look straight on, and you have the whole thing laid out before you. And if you're no Southern Baptist, when they get into gospel singing and all that, when they get high, they get high, and it's twice as high if you see that uh, reflected. So it is, it is a, a rit it helps the ritual uh, tremendously. Now, the main ritual there is the baptism. The original baptism was in River Jordan. So the symbolism of the River Jordan is pulled in here, and you see the river is pulled all the way to the altar, and it's reflected on the top. So sitting in the back row there, you could see a baptism here in the back row because it's reflected in the mirror and, and you, you, you can see that. The light is coming in from the top, lighting the faces. And um, well, so you can <laughs> Now the skin is very simple. It's a ribbed steel deck, except a little twist is given to it by, by, by giving some detail that takes it out of, the, out of the industrial siding category and you begin to work with the corduroy feel of the material and, and you put it in a, in, a, in, a different, in a different category. Then I am... Um, this, this is the second scheme. The entrance was elsewhere before. 
The entrance was kind of processional, low entrance coming up and into the space. We couldn't afford that. So we had to find an entrance there. After it was done, and this again I took two weeks or three weeks ago to make some of my points, I discovered that um, these are the houses where a lot of the people live who come to this church. As a matter of fact, this was a slum area and, and many of the houses there also had this interesting uh, development of the porch. And that gave the birth to the Venturi type of um, entrance or whatever you call it, postmodern. <laughs> Energy building that is very serious, very machine-like, very much saying we are in trouble. And uh, <laughs> I'm responding to it. Look at me, you know, I have, um, I have two sides. I'm uh, black on one side where I want to be heated up, and I'm silver on one side where I want to reflect the, the heat. Uh, I have very narrow aperture for uh, letting uh, the light and the vision and the awareness in, and I'm doing something. And, uh, and the truth is that everybody going by recognizes it. First it started by when it was under construction, people thought that it was, that we didn't paint it all, you know, that was half was painted and half was left out. Now, uh, when it's all done, uh, it talks. It is a billboard. It talks to the people and reminds them of, uh, of the problem that we have, and it also works. It's not just that it talks, I'm sorry. Uh, they, uh, this is the concept, and someone was kidding me today about sketches on napkins, but uh, this is a sketch that I would call it the conceptual sketch, because there are two, two parts of the concept. One could be the, the two-tone color and the, the recognition of the orientation uh, and the metaphor on, on that. The other is really the concept of, of uh, the use of light, of daylight, and how the narrow openings really act much bigger than they appear. And so I drew this sketch on a, uh, I have to tell you the story. I, <clears throat> I left the office for two weeks going on vacation, and I said that I, when I come back, I'm going to have the concept for this building. They always let me go when I promise something like that. Uh, and, I, and I here I am flying back and, and, uh, from Virgin Islands, and I still don't have the concept. <laughs> And, and so I'm, I'm, I'm just sitting there, and I'm sitting there, and I'm sitting there. And then I, I drew this. And it's interesting that it has stayed. It has stayed that way. We have computerized that, run through the computer. The only change is that this is a shallower reflector. But it stayed. But where it comes from, that is another interesting thing, that, that uh, as I go back, this is the house uh, in Italy, but it's not no news because we have seen those for years and years and years. Every building with thick walls have, has this splayed wall opening to uh, counter that incoming lumen uh, barrage there by splaying the wall so that there's a halo around the opening so it's not so bothersome to the eye. Well. This is a restaurant where I like to drink wine sometimes. That has already another interesting facet that has been contributing maybe to it. I'm, I'm just, just working now on the subconscious synthesis a little bit. And, um, and then, <laughs> <laughs> then here I am sitting alone in the plane, uh, and maybe that did it. I don't know, but it's interesting when you kind of go back and, and look at things, uh, maybe that's what it was. 
That is the cafeteria that has a little wider, a little um, higher window. The um, entrance starts with a piston, what we call the piston, red piston, and you, the red becomes the color that, that, uh, that uh, uh, connotes the, uh, the circulation. And uh, incidentally, the bull nose is a bent corner where the same color is bent around it. And that day, if you notice, there was a blue streak. That's where the opposite colors come together. But the same color is bent in the bull nose. The other is mitered corner. This is the, sec the second color, which is the, the, uh, uh, the circulation one. You go through that, and then you follow, follow the line to the elevators. And from the elevators, which are red, you go up and, and follow on that. Uh, through the floors. The um, other areas, like the cafeteria, is also kept in that technology and uh, uh, as, as the building itself, in the high technology. 1975, and you are looking at one of my favorite places also, which is Helsinki, Finland. But this is in January. It's terribly cold. Actually, the smoke is standing still. It can't get up. It's so, it's so cold that, that, um, that uh, it's just hanging there. Uh, you see that's a long exposure. But that's the famous White Cathedral. And somehow, my love for Finland, my old, old allegiance to Finnish people, to Finnish culture, music, and art, and, and uh, uh, auto kind of manifested in, in this commission that the State Department gave me, which was the, the embassy, United States Embassy to Finland. And um, I began to, I, I really spent a lot of time not making any commitment to the, to the, to the concept. And uh, when it finally, I was ready to draw, then, then I, this is the expression of the concept. It was a, it was a metaphor. The uh, Finland in this is represented by the granite base, the geological formation of the country, which is in a way carved out as a vase as a container. And in this container, there is, we pour in the, the America, the, uh, the technology, in a way, expressed through technology. And this technology now then is manifested into the roof form, and it's oozing out the openings, the window openings. And uh, it is a technology that does not exist in Finland. It is uh, purposely one that, where the, the stone technology is highly finished, the, the way they would work the granite, and they do it so beautifully. And then the other one is, is American technology, and that's high. And uh, so that is the, the um, basic thought. Without any, any uh, uh, I have to say that there is an homage to Alto, and I, I couldn't, I couldn't uh, stay away from it because if you build in Finland, if you, if you synthesize what is around you, the, the climate, the people, the materials, the, the, uh, uh, the culture around, and all that, you come very close. To, to the architecture that Alto is doing, particularly if you know what he has done. So without any, um, I can't find the word, uh, I, I say there is homage to Alto, and I, I, rec I recognize that and I want to. But the reasons for some of these things happening, which you see in plan, this is a roof plan of, of that building. That is purely a fictitious uh, uh, position. Uh, this is where it is located. Every, every angle and every, every wall is calculated, not calculated, but is, has meaningful uh, 
direction or, or reason for being bent, kinked, and all that. One of the reasons is that it is in a residential district and it is, it is also in a historical area. So we couldn't possibly put the numbers of square feet in the building that, that was the program required. So it began to, uh, to break down its scale from the walls to the roof and all that so we could accommodate the, the, um, um, the large volume. There was also a requirement so that you could see the Baltic Sea from the street across where we had the French embassy and the, and the um, uh, British embassy. In the plan, the inside is orthogonal, the uh, outside is polygonal, uh, as you can see, but there is no major conflict uh, in there. This is the main floor with the entrance. And I am now on the final one. In 1976, it's um, a building that takes a strange twist here. It is an, a, an extension of an existing building. The Corning uh, Glass Center is uh, one that uh, talks about glass through the ages, the manufacturing process, the process of the Corning uh, factory and all that. Uh, in, and housed in this white rectangle with this extension being the Stuben factory that shows how glass is made. The uh, collection is enormous for the uh, historical glass and uh, they need an, an expansion. I began to think of how to do it. Uh, I didn't believe that just adding three more bays to this, this um, uh, Mission Korean War era building would be the right thing to do. Why not give a, a, an expression of its own to this, to this uh, addition? And I was looking into the, into the metaphor possibly that could be used. I'm saying this in retrospect because I didn't. I really did the form and then I found that that was a metaphor. And um, so that the metaphor is glass itself. The glass is really amorphous one when it is in a heated state, when it's molten and it flows. When it is uh, cold, it has its inner structure. You see the amorphous shape, and then you see the structure inside. Now, the amorphous shape is not that frivolous. The amorphous shape is constructed from either convex and concave quarter circle or a straight line. And the effort here is to give as much exterior surface as, as you can for admission of daylight and, and uh, so out of this, out of that form, which was, this was purely a conceptual sketch, came the actual floor plan. And in the actual floor plan, there's a main gallery that displays the glass for the Jiffy Walker who wants to just see the uh, main pieces of glass making through the ages uh, and go on into the other things. And then for the studious one, you can go into the respective areas surrounding it. And they are as fat as needed to accommodate the collections. Now the blue line here is glass line and there are special exhibits placed in the uh, wall. The, uh, uh, you can see it in the, in the whole uh, pragmatic setting there. Uh, and there it is under construction. It will be finished next month. You can see the enclosing glass, the wall is glass as well. So that there is, uh, the glass metaphor is carried on, but the glass is special in the sense that it is textured glass, stainless steel coated in the back, and uh, it gives a, a, a very unique kind of um, uh, surface uh, expression. The low slung, the uh, exterior wall, it's thick again, and it works with a continuous periscope, which allows the views out, but doesn't let the sun and the light in. Uh, disrupting the, the displays that need low lighting, uh, case lighting. 
uh, and uh, so the main ambient light is coming from the display cases and not from ceilings or so. So the light is kept low. That's just a view in a, in a lobby. It's, it's highly glass, as you can see. Well, I, um, that's the last. And I, I can only repeat maybe what I said, that, um, that it is possible to create objectively, not by self-denial, but by balancing creativity and practical knowledge. You, you may want to dispute that, too, and we can talk about it. And the second thing is that I think architecture starts where words leave off. And uh, so uh, I may have talked too much, but I have also shown you a few things. So thank you. I never said that others don't have symbolism. I only talked about those buildings. I, I was not trying to say that these buildings that have the symbolism in them and nobody else does. Is that what is your impression? Why do you think your buildings have symbolism? Oh, because I, I, I search for it. I, I search for the, if there is, symbolism implied in the, in the, in the uh, problem. And if there is, and if it is, if it is uh, uh, justifiable, let's say, uh, to be expressed and to exist and to, in a sense, dominate sometimes, uh, that, is the, that is the judgment that is the hardest for the architect is to make those judgments. Uh, sometimes, because you have to use self-restraint there too. Sometimes you can go go too far. You may establish too good a relationship with your client, and you may push him over. Uh, he may allow you to do something that that maybe is 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 not very uh, you know uh, um, considered. So you really go through an awful lot of searching, soul searching. Yeah. Teaching do for your architecture? Well, question is, what does teaching do? Um, well, teach, teaching is absolutely mandatory as far as uh, I am concerned, because I have been teaching for 20 years. In other words, all my practice or all the buildings that you have seen here, uh, I have been also teaching during this, the time. To me, it's absolutely mandatory that I do. Uh, for one thing that I, I, um, I have a chance to verbalize, you know, with, uh, with the student. Uh, when I, I have a chance to, to lecture, I have a chance to, uh, uh, to uh, how I would say, I would, um, I could test a few things with the younger mind, the mind that is not uh, indoctrinated yet and all that. I can, I can work and uh, I can work on similar things that I'm working with, which I, I really prefer many times to work on the same. Many times we start at the same point. Uh, and and uh, I can work ahead and be ahead only because of 
maybe my experience where I don't have to re relate back and, and seek why. I know already why. But as far as the research is concerned and as far as the soul searching is concerned, we are in the same, in the same, on the same, on the same beam. Um, I think it goes both ways. I like to teach because the students need me and I need them uh, in this kind of uh, uh, in interchange. But there are certain things I wouldn't do. For instance, I don't like to design houses and all that. Yes? The question is how, how much design is controlled. Uh, I do control design very, very closely. But uh, I don't know if, whether you could take, get it out of what I said. Is it's a long time that I spend in designing. Uh, because if I, I allow that process not to be hurry, hurried by my insistence over anybody's insistence. I, I believe in, in subconscious uh, work. And, and I need my mind to work on it. And I, I, um, I don't care where I am, what I do. I know my mind is working. My best friend is, is, is working. And so everybody is tied into my rhythm. My, or, you know, and um, so design cannot be hurried up. And, and pushed or in any way uh, it takes time. So I control by that in a way I control the, the flow of thought and, and um, um, then I have, I have uh, a designer assigned to each project who works with me in, in, the, in for continuity and, and uh, one or two and then I, I really do control. I have to admit whether it's a, it's a virtue or sin, I don't know, but I do control that. Uh, because I, but in, there is a concept. And once the concept is stated, everything is implicit in the concept. It's, it's like a sperm. It carries everything in it, in, and it's there. Uh, so. Uh, I'm there to guide, to see that the concept is followed, that, that, um, uh, because it may, it may be misinterpreted or some way. Uh, or it may not be stated, let's say. I can tell from the previous what the concept is. Uh, but someone else just taking my sketch cannot. So I have to keep on. I have to stay on in saying, well, by this I mean that all the bases are maybe eight inch high and they are polished and, and that, that we have trim like this, that all the hardware is like that. You know, it goes down to detail. Concepts are not just the shells on the outside and then it breaks down on the inside. Concepts are going through the whole building. It's a very homogeneous thing, a concept. Yeah. Yes, there are several, <coughs> several steps. I, and I, when, I, when I talked about whatever I said today is as recent as five years, maybe. Uh, I, or when I first realized about uh, the fact that, that I don't have to draw everything. But there, are, there is this, what I call one, two, three. And that is, you, your hand draws, your eye sees, your, your mind, your brain analyzes, and, and then you draw again and again and again, and you know, sketch after sketch after sketch and all that. And, and when you would put those things one on top of the other, you would find that there are some, some common lines that you keep repeating the same thing over and over and over again. Now, it can be good or bad, but let's say in the positive sense, 
that is going to begin to, to show the direction uh, uh, your design would go. But uh, the truth is that you cannot draw anything that your brain doesn't tell you to do. Now, you can also put your hand in your pocket and your brain is still going to work, right? And you don't have to draw 1,500 sketches to, to get there. You just allow your mind to work. But then sometimes it gets stuck. It needs, uh, it needs a f to be fed. Then you may sketch for, for a while, and then you can go uh, uh, again. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Brian, this reprints your statement. You said that your drawings are different. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. I found your drawings are all the same. Like, uh, like, you know, more or less it's all wrong. You're more or less, I find you more or less like pop star. Like, uh, as Mark mentioned, the library, which he mentioned that it's moving, which is not to me. It's just more or less like a forum, like a school, a circle school, or the high school. Mm -hmm. It's a good thought. But I, I, uh, I think you are saying two things. One, you will agree that every building is different. But you will also then, I will agree with you that there is an overriding, overriding thread that goes through all of them. That there are some similarities. You are saying that all the buildings seek to be uh, individual uh, pieces, right? I mean, I would say, I would say it's done by the same architect. I mean, uh, uh, I don't know. <laughs> well, I don't mind it. I, I liked it because I, I think they are done by the same architect, and and but they're still different. So I, I like what you are saying. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, then you have to put it a little a uh, little stronger. All right, I, that's good. You are very sensitive to that, that there are similarities. And one is, I, I have to say, because I haven't said, said it before, that I'm, I'm definitely interested to make order out of disorder. But no, I'm trying to, to uh, put uh, maybe even the similar things, space and all that, in a form that organizes, that has a recognizable me meaning or a form uh, on the outside, which it can be or is geometric form, and many times very basic geometric form, a circle, a cube, a rectangle, or, and so on. I'm, whatever I can, I want order. And, and I'm not seeking disorder. And so far, I have not had, you have to remember also the fact that that my commissions have not been a full range of commissions. Because I have not worked in urban vernacular where I, for instance, I have to deal with, with, with anything that, that has pre-existed and all that. I have always worked in, in, uh, either, in, in isolation, in a way. Whatever you do becomes uh, freestanding, in a way. Very seldom I, uh, I have had any, any vernacular buildings. And I, I, I'm dying to do some, but I, you know. Yeah. The work we saw tonight, what uh, percentage of your entire body is this? Is this all the work that you've done, or you took a percentage? No, it's uh, all one third, maybe. Yes. Thank you. 
being recognized as a very highly uh, recognized artist. That's not ever well, I have, a, I have an answer to that. It is not the form, it's the methodology that I can be remembered by. And I think that, that it is uh, that what I was, the, the way the problem is solved and the attention that is given to the, to the facets, all of the facets in, in, in the synthesizing process, they imperfect nature that I have to, to, to uh, fads and, and uh, you know, that I, 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 I synthesize more that may happen in the world than, than in some other architect's mind on the East Coast. And or, you know, that, that is the, uh, I think that the, the uh, maybe the fact that, um, as I said, uh, that sort of, sort of steadfast projection and uh, uh, as I said I consider myself almost, almost an extrusion from the you know from from uh, from the time uh, and I I think that's the method and the, 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 uh, the basic philosophy the uh, absence Uh, and I'm, I'm throwing it in without any apprehension because you and other scientists can't shoot it. But I want to be clear that I don't, they came after, you know, after. I'm not claiming anything. I'm, I'm purely relying on the scientific of the crazy question. And this is what will not go over very easily. It isn't going over, I know it. It will, five years from now, maybe, as, as you will discover in your own things, and not necessarily architecture, how your subconscious works. Then you translate it into art, or use it in architecture. You'll see how beautiful it is. And I'm not about to criticize one way or the other, but let's say you do the five building. Don't you yeah. just sit down on a good afternoon and say, let's say, all right, well, let's do a triangle fire truck. No, sir. That's, that's what I'm trying to say. And I, there's nothing I can do to convince you because it doesn't, you know, it doesn't sound very convincing. But it isn't that. Would you think that would be wrong? Yes. I, well, it wouldn't be wrong, but I, I, I don't know how I could pre-think pre, uh, pre it, you know. Uh, and say I'm going to do a triangle. Uh, I, I don't know. I don't work that way. I, I... Well, is there any particular quote since you're stressing methodology that not necessarily architectural related, but uh, you feel it would be a value uh, regarding something? Uh, regarding well, the, uh, the thing, the biggest problem that we have is that uh, first we can, first we have to visualize. And even architects, so few can visualize. I take my students, one out of 10, two out of 10 can visualize. I have to teach them how to visualize by go to the reverse method. I have them recall which means to visualize something that they have seen before. So I tell them to draw up their room, uh, to remember their room when they were age six or sixth grade or seventh grade and draw it. Think about it. See that mental picture, visualize it and draw it. That's what we call. That is something you can uh, visualize something that has happened, you can recall. Now in architecture, we visualize something that has never happened. We have to create. It has never happened before. So now, you create that, or you see the, the mental image. Now get it, down on, on, get it down on paper. That is the trick. 
That is what you have to, what we have to teach the students how to get, first of all, how to get the mental image of something that has never existed before, particularly if you care to work with concepts that have never existed before. That's why so many actors do the damn thing over and over again, because they just have that image, and it goes on and on and on and on. They're not created. They have stopped being created. Now, if you have to create, if you want to create something that never existed before, you have to have the ability to take it from here down to there. That is visualization. That is creativity, creation, visualization, and then realization on paper. And that is the whole secret. Now, if you have a baggage, if you have a baggage, a heritage, a cultural, and social, ethnic, you have tremendous baggage already. And, but you may be image poor. We don't invent new, nothing new. We just superimpose millions and trillions of images that we have seen before. We just superimpose them. If you haven't seen enough, you are not, you cannot create. You don't, you are image poor. You come out of, you, if you take, if you take a person out of Podan somewhere, where there are 50 houses and, and, and uh, no high rise, and there is uh, uh, certain architectural vernacular around, and you take him away there and say, draw me whatever, a house or that. He will draw one of those things, or similar to that because he has no other images. And you take and you give a, uh, someone in Manhattan to draw a, some, you have an entirely different kind of solution to the same problem. It is that what is your heritage, what is your baggage, what is your knowledge, what do you know, how image rich you are. That's why we want to look at things, we want to read, we want to travel, uh, and we have to be exposed to images. And that allows our mind to work with them. It's not coming out of your hand. Your hand is very, very unskilled tool as far as an architect is concerned. Your mind is moving you. Your brain is moving you. Your hand, no. So uh, the whole power that in, in our profession is up here. And that is what I preach and teach. And that if I will not be remembered maybe for, for having uh, the same form language on and on and on and on. But I think that, that, that uh, I will be able to make aware the profession where it comes. And also to, to understand why it hasn't come with our masters because they stopped at one point. 